Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle Program, Defining Concepts in Current Media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is the, is the uh, Philosophical Equations of Economics. And uh, these books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Uh, with my with me is my co-host and colleague um, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale and is a has an MBA from Wharton and is a uh, venture capitalist on the West Coast. Good to see you, Rick. And you. This week uh, we're going to discuss since the uh, election has given us such a quite a reversal uh, in the fortunes of the re- Republicans. So this week we're going to discuss going to compare the Republicans to the Democrats of the last eight years. And, and so which is which party is better for the United States? Which, which is better, the Republicans or the Democrats? So the country has swung back from the Democrats' control of the government to the Republicans. And, and throughout the history, We've elected and chosen different parties, never staying with the same party for very long. But uh, pretty much for the last 150 years, we've divided ourselves into the uh, Republicans and and Democrats. And so it's occurred to me to bring up the subject of which is better for the United States. Which political party is better? Is there a better political party? So, um, So the big question of this is how to determine this and how do we go about knowing which is better? Is it possible to even make such a decision? Well, let's try and let's have some fun. So now we have to ask ourselves, where do we start in order to answer this question? Well, I think the best place to start is giving us a definition of the original difference between a conservative and a liberal. And uh, perhaps I, I should discuss it when, you know, when I was at school and uh, I approached this question for the first time of defining the difference between a Republican and a Democrat. I, I looked to what had already been written and uh, it seemed to indicate that the basic difference was that liberals believe in a wide interpretation of the U.S. Constitution and the conservative Republicans believe in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. And I I believe this is a a pretty good criteria by which to know the difference, but it doesn't tell us the whole story of the difference between really what what has emerged to be two different ideologies out of these two different parties. So so more recently, I considered the the problem again, and I discovered that there is a, a more essential difference between the two. This essential difference causes them um, causes them to strictly or loosely interpret the, the Constitution. So my more recent definition that that uh, that delineates the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans is that the Democrats feel that the other person is inherently not so good uh, and not to be trusted, and the Republicans believe that. The person with whom you come into a uh, into contact with and uh, is inherently good, uh, and this outlook, um, whether a person is actually good or whether he's essentially bad, is what is the true underlying difference in the philosophies that emerge from the left and from the right. Once we understand that. The Democrat wants to believe that the other person is bad, inherently bad by his nature. We can now understand his his penchant for establishing regulation and the many laws that we generate from our government governing the behavior of other people. So once we understand that the conservative Republican believes that actually the other person is is good in his behavior. We we see his penchant for deregulation and particularly overall freedom. 
So once we see that the conservative Republican wants freedom, we can see that he needs a strict reading of the Constitution in order not to change things, in order not to, to, to change his freedom. Once we see that the Democrat has the penchant for more regulation, we can see that his reading of the Constitution should be loosely interpreted in order to allow for more regulation uh, and, uh, and, to, and to govern uh, the, the freedom or to take away the freedom of, of, a, of an individual. But still, the, the, the main question remains, which is better for America? Which is better for the American society? Which is better, a well-regulated society or one that maximizes freedom? So far, it's a tie. So now, we have to determine what is the nature of good. That is, what is the nature of all that is good for the individual? And thus we can determine what is the nature of, of really what is good for the American society, as individuals make up society. Well, the nature of, of that which is good is that which promotes our survival and takes us up away from misery. And, and what takes us up from misery are all the things that we produce in society. And we have two sides, the physical side and the cultural side. And the cultural side is our behavior. And the physical side are all the goods and services that we produce. So how do we measure this betterment and, uh, and this goodness that brings us up away from misery? We could, we could begin this task by making an equation. And uh, this equation would be all that we sacrifice. And we, we sacrifice to gain all the rewards. And these rewards are divided into, into our two categories that we just mentioned. The first category are all the things that we produce, goods and services. The second category is all the services that and, and behavior that we produce. And then the third category is all the, the, the behavior that we produce while cooperating and being with other people in our society. So all our actions can be summed up when we do something as a sacrifice and the, and the contents of the sacrifice is as follows. The nature of all sacrifice have the following components. First is time. That is, that is the time that we spend in, in making our, in our, our, our daily decisions and our daily sacrifices to, uh, to achieve something. Secondly, we have all the effort that we put in to, the, to that sacrifice um, and, and all the knowledge and information that we need to do these sacrifices. And we make the sacrifice by, uh, by expanding our time and our effort and using all our knowledge in, the in, the, in an atmosphere of risk and, and also opportunity as all life encounters risk in everything it does. And of course, the flip side to this is that uh, we encounter opportunity in all that we do also. There, it's really two, uh, two sides to the same coin. We, um, so, uh, and, and so we can actually quantify each of these components. And if we add them up, we can get something equivalent to the gross domestic product of the United States. Um, which would, would which would roughly uh, equal the reward of all our sacrifices. On the cultural side of things, our, our social behavior is is not so easily quantified, but it still it still can be. Uh, it 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 can't be uh, because the individual components are quantifiable uh, to a certain extent. It does all it does add up. Um, so in, in totaling all the sacrifices on the physical side, we can see that our GDP is a, is a rough estimate of the, of the goodness and betterment of, uh, of our society. And, um, and on the behavioral cultural side, we can add up all the things that sociologists make uh, in, distingu in distinguishing our behavior. Uh, and we can total that up to see how much betterment in a, is in our society because action is quantifiable. So all these things are actually are quantifiable. Uh, time is quantifiable and um, uh, risk is quantifiable and 
uh, our effort is quantified. We could say that uh, uh, our effort could be uh, used. Uh, we could say uh, ergs and time in seconds or hours and uh, and uh, knowledge. Could, we could say are, are in bits of knowledge. Um, so uh, now we can compare the quantities uh, produced with regulation or with uh, or with total freedom, and and we can see where it leads. Um, we can predict that when society has greater freedom and less re regulation that we will produce more goods and services. And we can predict this because in freedom there is a greater amount of free floating knowledge and information. And information is the most important part of our, of our equation. We know this because our, our effort is, is fixed at a certain amount. There's only 24 hours a day. We've got to sleep, and and the and the and the time is also uh, fixed uh, uh, in a certain amount. And so, really, truly, the only real variables that remain are are knowledge and risk to the greatest extent. And the knowledge uh, is is often able uh, to reduce risk. Um, uh, that is the uh, and that, and that's the aim of of much of our intellectual effort is to produce more knowledge. Uh, and to allow us to be more efficient in in the use of our time and our effort and uh, and, and the risk that that comes into our lives. So now uh, knowledge being the predominant factor, um, uh, uh, and as it increases, uh, so does uh, the corresponding reward. And consequently, the more knowledge in a society, the higher standard of living. And, uh, and uh, the way to increase knowledge in, in, in a society is to give it as much freedom as possible. This is accomplished by reducing regulation, allowing for the free formation of knowledge in, in, in the consciousness. Uh, from, from the way to, re, uh, to reduce a, an increase um, uh, of, of knowledge and, and ideas to uh, allow the, all the individuals in society produce and... and um, and and and, pro and and produce a, a greater amount of knowledge. And the more people that are in society, and the more knowledge that they possess, uh, they will produce an ever greater amount of goods and services. And uh, thus, um, uh, society will benefit from a from from this greater production. And thus, uh, there's a greater there's a greater quantity of betterment in in society. If we were to put regulations inside our our equation of our sacrifice and our, our sacrifice which equals the reward we'd have to include it as a coefficient of, of knowledge and regulations would have to be a negative coefficient because regulations essentially is uh, is negative knowledge but now the question arises as to uh, whether all regulations at all times are, are negative knowledge, uh, and um, that is, uh, is it never good to have regulations? Well, there are circumstances in which regulations are good, uh, in which laws are good, and, and Milton Friedman talked about this, and he gave an example about uh, environmental issues, uh, such as the upstream effect, where, and uh, uh, which may require independent monitoring, uh, and. Um, because otherwise an upstream factory can pollute the downstream private property and uh, and so he said yes there are there is a, there's a role for for regulations um, and and there are circumstances where government uh, uh, where government purpose with its laws and regulations are are really are really good um, so we have to make a system uh, where the the twain shall meet and governmental laws and regs uh, meet the the needs and requirements of society. And here's a suggestion uh, for the for the Republicans to demand of the Democrats: every law and regulation should come with a needs analysis to indicate whether our society, uh, 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 the rewards that come to the, to our society uh, from the regulation and or, or law is worth the societal sacrifice. So uh, enough of me. Let's, let's find out what Rick thinks about uh, the, whether the left or right is better for, uh, for the American society. Rick, what's, uh, what's your summation? Especially in light of the, uh, of the, the election that we've just uh, uh, gone through. Well, um, at this juncture in history, it's pretty clear that 
conservative candidate uh, and conservative orientated government is what's called for the stock market. Uh, and that's only one data point. It's cheering Trump's election. Uh, the status, whether they are at the uh, press, like the New York Times and the Economist, uh, or at the European Union, um, uh, or elsewhere in, in the U.S. government, are up in arms and um, claiming that you know Trump's going to ruin the country and. And there are actually a number of business leaders who are saying the same thing. Witness the CEO of PepsiCo and so forth. Um, and that's all very good news. Um, because what Trump is, appears to be succeeding in doing is, is, is governing as potentially a conservative. And I only say this because on the basis of his appointments thus far. Um, I think liberals were hoping that since Trump uh, was originally a Democrat and only became uh, a Republican relatively recently, he would actually be the you know the most purple uh, leader imaginable, uh, and if anything else, he, he would he would he would point uh, a variety of Democrats and Republicans to the main cabinet post. That was the assumption, actually. What he has done instead is appoint uh, conservatives both within the U.S. government uh, and without the U.S. government. Um, Jeff Sessions is Attorney General. Um, uh, Wilbur Ross is Commerce Secretary. That are uh, ideologically conservative and they act according to their words. They are not extemporizing um, politicians who don't stick to their principles. And that's why individuals like um, uh, those two, uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, who's been a strong supporter of uh, charter schools as uh, head of the education, Department of Education, these are really striking appointments uh, of persons who have an ax to grind with uh, areas in the economy or education or elsewhere that are very obviously failing and which, quite frankly, uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have jointly uh, helped to sustain. So I think, you know, the Republicans, certainly at the federal level, uh, can't be too uh, self-congratulatory about what this election means. This was an election against uh, the Republican and Democratic establishment. And while uh, Trump appears to be using certain portions of that establishment on the Republican side, on balance, he, he appears to be, uh, at least in the initial stages of, of forming a government, leaning toward uh, a more principled, um, an ideologically conservative uh, uh, strategy going forward, um, and I, you know, I, I'm tremendously impressed. Uh, of course, at the state level, this process of uh, the country turning red has been going on pretty much since the day Obama took office. Right? We now see Republican uh, dominated legislatures, governors. Uh, in, in tremendous majorities across the country uh, compared to eight years ago. So, you know, as the states have always been, and you know, this is nothing uh, new, have always been the laboratories for um, uh, what tends to happen at a later stage at the federal level. And so, to that extent, the Republicans at the state and local levels have clearly uh, been the keepers of the flame in terms of addressing the overregulation you speak of, um, the um, uh, excess uh, illegal immigration you speak of, it's, it's the state level that action has been been taken, uh, not at the federal level by a Republican-controlled Congress. 
You know, you spoke of uh, the conservatives uh, that uh, Trump are producing are principled. Uh, you want to explain what uh, what you mean by principled? Well, I, I think um, with a guy like Jeff Sessions, uh, he's you know he's been criticized for years for being anti-immigrant, and you know he's worn that badge proudly. He has a distinguished history as a state attorney general, and uh, and the Senate as well, um, and he, he hasn't deviated from his policy. He has said time and time again, illegal immigration has to be stopped. But this is how we need to do it, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I I want to build support toward that end. Uh, he has not compromised with the establishment Republicans on having some sort of. Uh, clemency for millions of illegal immigrants, cutting some sort of deal with the, with the Democrats. Well, let's, let's let a few in here and we'll keep a few out there. And No, that's not been his approach. Uh, he said um, he, he directly links poor wages in the United States, and that's obvious to anyone who can read a newspaper over the last 20 years, to an excess of labor. And the, and a principal source of that excess labor is a combination of illegal and legal immigration. So, um, can you sum up your, uh, I guess, your, your, your principled conservatives? Will they or will they not produce uh, a, uh, a betterment for society going forward? Are they good for American society going forward? I think these conservatives are, are, are you know, are very encouraging picks. A guy like Wilbur Ross, who's about as caustic when it comes to criticizing the federal government as one could possibly be, I think has been sent into the uh, Commerce Department to, to more or less tear it down, reduce it in size, not only uh, reduce the impact of the regulation, but actually reduce the department in size which is also needed. I think uh, someone like Betsy DeVos will do something similar uh, at the Department of Education. She will actually reduce the department in size as well as roll back the impact of, of the numerous regulations uh, that they visited upon the, the state and the localities. Uh, so that's what encourages me because the, 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 the machinery of the federal government has to be reduced. And the uh, establishment Republicans, along with the establishment Democrats, have utterly failed to do that for years. Under, under Obama, under Bush before that, for years and years. And to that extent, the establishment Republicans are just as guilty as the Democrats. Ergo, an election of an outsider. Yes. Okay, Rick. Uh... I want to thank you for your uh, your comments, and uh, and we'll see everybody next week on the Philosophical Angle program. See you then.